turn to the book of Judges. To Judges chapter 2, I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 5. Brother Wade mentioned, I've taken for the title of the message this morning, Prone to Wonder, as we have just sung just a moment ago. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I suppose if there was a subheading for the book of Judges, that it might be that phrase. Prone to wonder. This is the story of the Israelites in the day of the Judges. After the days of Joshua, when Joshua dies, you have this period of uh, Israelite history in which judges came and led the people. Uh, this proneness to wonder, though, uh, is it's not limited to the people of Israel in the day of the judges, but it's, it seems to be uh, the story of God's people in general. And not only with the people of Israel in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, but certainly that proneness to wonder continues on today. And so I pray this morning that as we look at this passage that is before us, that we might learn some lessons uh, from the experiences of Israel in these days of the judges that would help us today to be able to, be able to avoid uh, this sinful condition of wandering away from the Lord. So, Judges chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And please note in your bulletin, and as well as it will be projected behind me, we have a responsive reading from Psalm 119 that we will speak together after the reading of our text. Judges chapter 2 now, beginning at verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said... I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. And the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel. The people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named that place Bochum, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. Would you join me now in our reading? I will begin the reading, and then you respond where the bold print is there. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our desire now would be that you would teach us your word, that your word would find its place in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee, that we might not wander away from you. O oh Lord, bless now this word to our hearts and our minds that we may indeed know it, that we might live by it. Teach us. O oh Lord, we seek 
your blessings now. We confess our need for discernment. We confess that we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit who inspired the writer to pen these words. Speak to our hearts now. And bless us, we humbly ask. In Jesus' name. And amen. I recently saw a cartoon picture of Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And in the cartoon, it was raining. And Charlie Brown had an umbrella to help keep the rain off of him. of that cartoon read this way. Life isn't meant to be easy. It's meant to be lived, sometimes happy, other times rough. But with every up and down, you learn lessons that make you strong. Now, I would think that We all here would agree uh, with that thought uh, of life's experiences with its ups and downs and probably more so with the downs that we learn lessons that make us strong. And I think if I were to ask many of you, perhaps most of you, to If that was your testimony, you would probably say yes. Well, from the study of the book of Judges, it would seem that the nation of Israel would offer that testimony themselves. That they became a much stronger nation because of the lessons that they learned from all of the ups and downs that they experienced. But sadly, if you've read the book of Judges, you you know that that is not the case. It seems as though that they never learned these lessons. As soon as a judge would be raised up by the Lord to redeem the people from whatever sorrowful circumstances that they were enduring, that as soon as that judge died, the people reverted to rebellion against God. You would think that after maybe a couple of such experiences of these ups and downs, that they would have learned their lesson that it was better to obey God. And that they in learning those lessons, would have become strong in their devotion to God. But as I said, that wasn't the case, for they were, as we sung a few moments ago, prone to wonder. They were prone to leave the God that they loved. Or did they love God at all? That perhaps is the greater question here. What is apparent, though, as we read through this history of Israel at this time, is that certainly their hearts were divided. This is the history of the people of Israel during, as I said, the times of the judges, and it, and it seemed to be the history throughout all of the Old Testament They continually would turn away from the one true God in order to serve the gods of the Canaanites. And God had warned them that that would be so if they did not remove the Canaanites from the land. And as you begin with the book of Judges, you will see that that is what happened. The tribes of Israel failed to... Uh, conquer the nations around them to drive them away and and so they were left there and 
and this is going to pose a problem for them uh, for the remainder of their history in the Old Testament. But as I said, it sounds like, and it appears, brothers and sisters, that their experiences back then are not unlike ours today. For many who would call themselves Christians do similar works of rebellion. They may not bow down to pagan gods like Israel of old did, but they do give their hearts to things like status, perhaps Their jobs become what is important to them above serving the Lord. Perhaps it is even recreation. You know, anything that takes priority above serving God, anything that replaces God as the object of one's affection becomes an idol. And brothers and sisters, friends, we are all subject to such rebellion. We all are prone to wonder, prone to leave the God that we love. So how is it that we avoid this sin, this proneness to wonder? How is it that we can maintain our faithfulness? Our devotion to God. What can we learn from the example of the Israelites that would help us to avoid the anger and the chastisement of God? These are some of the questions that I want to address, want to try to answer from the text that's before us. So let's look now at this text. And now what I want you to note, first of all, as we look at this, is the necessity of remembering. The necessity of remembering. Remembering that we are, as the redeemed of God, we are the children of God. That that is our identity. Being children of God, we are then obligated To keep our end of the covenant made with God. Which I believe can be summarized by this. Loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then loving our neighbors as ourselves. Those were the way that our Lord you remember, summarized the moral law, saying that on those two principles of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbors as yourselves, so was the, was the law of Moses and the law of the prophets. And so he summarized those things in those two ways. And so we must remember who God is. And what God has done for us. Israel in the time of the judges. As we see here. Failed to remember these things. We would, might would call it. They had spiritual amnesia. And that I believe is implied here. And it's actually stated as you go on and read. Uh, throughout this, this, uh, this passage. Um, for instance, let's, let's look at that real quick. In verse 11 of this second chapter. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And it says in verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about 
so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. And so we see what disobedience brings. It brings the judgment of the Lord. Now, as I said, we see this mostly implied here in the text that I read to you at the beginning. Look at verse 1 with me. This, this thought of their failure to remember. It says there, now the angel of the Lord came up to Gilgal to Bochum. Now, I want us to certainly look at this angel of the Lord here and, and to identify him, but... Let's hold off for that a moment. I want for us to look at this thought of these two cities. What the significance is of Gilgal and Bochum. Gilgal was a special place in the history of Israel. Gilgal was the first place that Israel encamped after they crossed the Jordan River. After they entered into the land of Canaan after their fall, uh, uh, going into the wilderness for the 40 years, after they were walking around for 40 years, they now have crossed over the Jordan River and, and they come to this place called Gilgal. And it was there, you may remember, that they placed the stones that they took up from the Jordan River. And those stones there were erected, and they were meant to serve as a reminder of the people of the power of the Lord and the provision of the Lord that they experienced in their lives in bringing them primarily through the Jordan River or crossing the Jordan River. If, if we see this in Joshua chapter 4, in verse 19. And I want to read that passage to you. Uh, Joshua chapter 4 and verse 19. Look there with me. There it says, Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Those twelve stones which they had taken from the Jordan Joshua set up at Gilgal. Now those twelve storm, uh, stones, of course, represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Those twelve stones, going on reading in verse 20, which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. These stones, you see, then were to be a reminder of what God did. And what did God do? Verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord God dried up the waters of the Jordan, excuse me, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So we see here uh, the purpose of the stones, that they were to be a constant reminder uh, to the people of God of what he had done for them. Also, it was at Gilgal where this new generation of Israelite men were circumcised, where the covenant with God was renewed with them, where they were reminded of their covenantal obligations as the people of God. That they were to serve God with and worship him only where they were re reminded that they were the peculiar treasure unto the Lord. And it was at Gilgal where they observed for the first time in the land of Canaan the feast of Passover, that feast of remembrance. Remembering the time when the 
blood was sprinkled on the doorpost and lintels of the houses that they were in in Egypt. And that when the death angel saw the blood, he passed over, sparing their lives, sparing the lives of the firstborn. And that name, the name Gilgal itself, means rolling. And it, there is the thought of the rolling away of the old life in Egypt to now living a new life in the land of Canaan. Gilgal was a place of worship. It was there where the tabernacle was located, where the offerings of sin were made. And that was Gilgal. Now contrast that now with the city of Bochum. This place, Bochum, which means tears. And you see that in verse 4 of our text. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the sons of all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named that place Bochum, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. I just want you to consider this great contrast here between these two cities. That, that seems to me to be the significance of this thought of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, going up from Gilgal to Bochum Whatever amount of distance that that was, was so much different in the way the people responded to God. This angel of the Lord said, I will not drive them out before you. This was the source of their weeping. Speaking of the Canaanites, he wasn't going to drive out the Canaanites before them. And so what we see here, we see uh, this failure to remember the goodness of God, the, the, the power of God. We go from Gilgal where there was joy in remembering the power and providence of God to now sadness for being under the judgment of God. Where there was gladness in the worship of God, there is now weeping for their wandering away from God. Weeping for God's judgment upon them. Gilgal represented new life. Bochum represented the sin and judgment of God. From great joy that was experienced to Gilgal, in Gilgal to weeping in Bochum. And the cause for this great change is their wandering away from God. Their failure to obey God led to their wandering away from God. And which brings us to this thought of this angel of the Lord. Who is he? Is he one of God's creatures? An angel? A created being? And that's what a creature is by definition. It, it, is, a, it is one. Is he or Michael the archangel? And why I, I say that is because of all the I statements seen in, pass, in, in, in this passage in verse 1. Look there at verse 1. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into which uh, land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Look at verse 2. You have not obeyed me. Verse 3, therefore I said, I will not drive them out before you. I don't believe, brothers and sisters, that a created being, an angel, in that way, would speak in this way, in the first person. No, what I believe what we see here, as I understand, is, is what is seen in Joshua chapter 5 in the appearance of the captain of the Lord's host, when that captain of the Lord's host meets with Joshua there before, the, before they take uh, the city of Jericho. And in that, in that uh, confrontation there, you might remember that captain of the Lord's host telling Joshua to take his shoes off from his feet, for the ground he was on was holy ground. 
that appearance of the captain of the Lord's host uh, is what is referred to as a theophany. Or in this case, I think perhaps better, it is a Christophany or a Christophany. That is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, that, that this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. And that is, I believe, who this angel of the Lord is. He comes up from Gilgal, the place where the people were told to remember, the place where the people remembered the blood sprinkled on the doors that caused the death angel to pass by, the place where the people remembered that it was the power of God that brought them out of the bondage in Egypt. To remember it was the provision of God that brought them through the wilderness and now into the land of Canaan. To receive the promise of their inheritance. Now this angel of the Lord comes to Bochum. Not as a deliverer. But rather as a judge himself. A judge to bring judgment upon the people for their sin of rebellion against him, against Yahweh the Lord. They didn't obey God. Failure on behalf of the people of God to remember God, to remember his grace, to remember his goodness, to remember his power to save, to remember his provision to nourish and to protect brings the chastisement of God, especially he will bring such chastisement when there is the presence of the sin of idolatry. Moses warned them of this while he was alive, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 23. He said, take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. church at Ephesus, as we remember, as you may remember, as we were going through this at the beginning of the year, the church at Ephesus was guilty of wandering away from God. They were guilty particularly of, of them having left their first love. They were doing good things, but Christ was not foremost in their hearts and minds. Something else, you see, had, had gained their favor. And Jesus said to them, repent or else that he would take away their presence among him, their candlestick. This failure to remember God to remember God's power, to remember God's provision, to remember God's mercy, to remember God's deliverance, you see, will lead to this sin of wandering away from God. We must each take inventory of our own life to see if somehow Christ is not preeminent in our life. The Lord has ceased to be preeminent in the life of the Israelites during this period of the judges, and they suffered for it. God does not change, brothers and sisters, friends. He is the same yesterday as he is today and as he will be tomorrow. And he will not have second place in the hearts of his people. And so there is a price to be paid for wandering away from God. Israel paid this price over and over and over and over again. And they never learned the lessons 
of rebellion against God. The question now have we learned such lessons? Have we learned such lessons? The Israelites failed to give all of their heart, soul, and mind and strength to God. They chose to serve other gods. That was Israel. What about us? What about you? What has life's up and downs taught you about your relationship with God? I want to close with some thoughts, or perhaps better, some lessons that we should take to heart from the ups and downs of Israel in the Old Testament. Lessons that I pray now will make us stronger in our devotion to God such that we will not be those who, it would be said, wandered away from God. To keep from this proneness to wander away from God, we must constantly be reminded of what God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We must be ever mindful of what God has done to us and for us. He has adopted us. The redeemed of the Lord are, are the adopted children of the Lord. We are his children. And as such, we need to act as his children, as they should act, in adoring him, and loving him, and obeying him. To keep from the proneness to wander away from God, we, we don't need to go over to Brother Brandon's place and the Geechee River and draw out rocks for us to remember, but rather we need to remember that God is our rock. It is only as we build our lives upon Him that we thrive. As we sing, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. He must be our rock. We need to remember as well that our salvation, our deliverance from bondage to sin required the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, to be shed and sprinkled upon us. So that the angel of the second death would pass over us. To keep from wandering away from God, we must remember that Jesus has conquered our enemies. The greatest of which is Satan. For by his own death he has crushed the head of Satan, that great serpent. We must remember as well to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And that Christ must be first in our life. He must be preeminent in our life. And we must remember to love our neighbors as ourselves. That we are not only servants of God, but we also are servants of one to another. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. These are ways, brothers and sisters, I think, that we can avoid our wandering away from God. But we know we battle against the flesh, don't we? And sometimes the flesh prevails. And I want to leave you with this one final thought. I want to speak of the love and mercy of God that he shows to 
despite we can be. We serve a merciful God who will leave the 99 sheep that are in the fold and he will go and search for and bring back that one who wandered away. There's always hope. There's always hope. You may have a family member right now or someone that's dear to you, someone that you know who has wandered away. You ought to pray for them. You ought to speak to them when you can. You ought to talk with them. But pray. Pray that God would open their eyes, that they might see the errors of their ways. God found us. He finds his own. Let us learn. Let us learn from the failures of the Israelites during the days of the judges. Let us remember that as the people of God, as the children of God, we are a peculiar treasure unto Let's pray. Oh God, we do bless your name this morning. We magnify it. We exalt you. For you are a gracious and merciful God. You may allow us, because of the hardness of our own hearts, to wander away from you. But if we are truly your own, you will not leave us in such a state. But through the goodness, your goodness, you lead us to repentance. And oh, what a wonderful, beautiful picture it is in that wonderful parable of the lost son who when he finally comes to himself and realizes he has wasted his life and desires to return to his father's house, if it were to be only as a servant, instead, as he approaches the house of his father, the father runs to him, throws his arms around. such things to unworthy sinners. Oh Lord, help us to always remember what you have done to us and what you have done for us. And in our ability to be reminded of these things, we would not be found wanderers, wandering away from you. Bless these thoughts now to the hearts of these that are here. Perhaps there is one here this morning who has wandered away from you. Oh Lord, speak to them now. Cause their eyes to be opened to their sinful situation. But not only that, but their eyes would be opened to you, their God. Thanks.